Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Savoy Smith. I am a contributor here at Search the Scriptures, and I am a pastor at Eternal Truth Church here in San Antonio, Texas. Once uh, everything dies down with this current outbreak, uh, I absolutely welcome everyone to, uh, to join as much as we can fit in our small little church. I uh, hope everybody is doing well and being safe during this time. Uh, take it seriously. Um, so today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, the, the title is Fear of the Lord and what that means. So we're going to go over quite a bit of scripture today uh, and, and just kind of look into it. We're not going to go into an exhaustive study of what it is. There's so much more that I actually would like to do and maybe we'll break this into another part for another time. But we'll just go. On, we'll just dive into it, but not all the way deep. Somewhat deep. We were talking about this uh, in our previous Bible study. Uh, we have our Bible studies at 7:30 uh, on Fridays. 7:30 is in the evening. So, if uh, anyone would like to join, we do it. Um, we do it through uh, Messenger, Facebook Messenger, right now. So, if anybody would like to join, then please just hit us up on the page. You're more than welcome to, to join in. That's when we dive deep into scripture. So we're talking about fear of the Lord. So uh, what does this mean? Does it mean to have an actual fear, like being afraid of someone? Or is it uh, basically respect, just respecting someone? Uh, and it can be translated in, uh, either way. Um, and But we want to look into what scripture uh, sh uh, says and what does it show about what it means to uh, to fear the Lord? So let's 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 jump into it. And the question is: Are we truly to be afraid of the Lord? Are we truly to be afraid of God? So we're going to look at some scriptures. So we're going to jump right in. Exodus. So Exodus chapter one, verses fifteen through seventeen. That's Exodus chapter one verses 15 through 17 and it says then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua when you help the Hebrew women give birth observe them as they deliver if the child is a son kill him but if it's a daughter she may live the Hebrew midwives however feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them they let the boys live. Thank you, Veronica. So we have a little bit of background. Uh, they are in the middle of some very harsh treatment. They were, they're in slavery, and they're being oppressed pretty harshly, very, very harshly. Uh, so you can imagine, you can imagine uh, the kind of punishment that they could receive, these two midwives could receive by disobeying the king. So they could be, uh, I mean, they're already, just by being uh, an Israelite, they are already being oppressed in, in a very, very harsh slavery, and they're told to murder these kids, to kill these, uh, these, these babies if they're they a boy. But they disobeyed that command from the king. Uh, so their fear of God was greater than their fear of the punishment of the king. Right. So again, we're talking about what it is to fear the Lord. So let's go on to find out what happens. So continuing on, I'm going to jump to Exodus chapter one, verses 20 through 22. It's Exodus chapter one, verses 20 through 22. And it says, so God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Pharaoh then commanded all his people, You must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. So, interesting enough, God's response to the midwives' fear was to reward them. He was good to them and gave them families. So they feared God. They were more afraid of him than they were of the king and in response to that God rewarded them in an interesting side note that we talked about in our uh, in our Bible study was that um, that they're in the midst of this geno genocide 
and God was present, but he did not stop it. All right, so God was present because we know because he is honoring these midwives who are in the midst of it. But he didn't say, okay, that's enough. Every this I see this is going on now. Wow, this is crazy. Stop it. No. He allowed it to continue. That to me proves that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. Because all of us, if we were in a position of God, would have stopped it. Just let's just be honest. We would have. So that proves to me that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So continuing on, let's look at another example of uh, of uh, someone fearing the Lord. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. Genesis 22, 12. And that says, Then he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. So, a little bit of background. Uh, God appears to uh, Abraham and tell him, hey, sacrifice your son, your only son, to me, right? And so he goes and does it. He goes, that's what he's there for. He's go, he goes up there to do that. God stops him. But the important thing to note is that uh, he acknowledged Abraham's fear because he didn't withhold his only son. So he didn't withhold his only son. So as much, now we know he loves his son. He loves him. This is the son that was promised to him. So he loves him. Even still, he feared God more so than his love of his son. And he did as the Lord commanded. So let's find out what happened afterwards. Uh, let's continue on. I'm going to Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 through 18. Genesis chapter 22 verses 16 through 18 and that says and said by myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration because you have done this because you have done this thing and have not withhold your only son I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. So again, we see someone being rewarded because of their fear of God. He specifically said, because you have done this, you have followed my command. You feared God, right? You, didn't, you did not withhold your only son from me. Then, because of this, because you feared the God, because you feared the Lord, I will bless you, and everyone else will be blessed through you, right? So all these blessings, blessings came raining down on Abraham and his descendants, specifically because he feared the Lord. Okay, so we're gonna go to another scripture here. We're gonna look at another example, and we're gonna uh, kind of stick with this example. We're going to go to Job and look at what happened with him. So in Job, we're going to go to Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So there's Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says, There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of perfect integrity, who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. So here we have another example of someone who feared the Lord and was extremely blessed because of it. Because it literally says there, that uh, he was a man of perfect integrity who feared God. So he was afraid of the Lord. And because of that fear, he was blessed, ex extremely blessed. So we have uh, so far three examples of, uh, of four people 
who were extremely blessed because of their fear of the Lord. Now, I do not want uh, us to think or be of the mindset that because I fear the Lord, nothing bad will happen to me. All these great things will come my way. Well, this is the reason why I bring up Job. Many of you know the story of Job, so we're going to break it down by a few verses at a time. So, continuing on in Job chapter 1. So, we're going to go Job 1, 4 through 5. Job chapter 1, 4 through 5. And it says, His sons used to take terms having banquets at their homes. They would send an invitation to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting, banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. So, Job had all these children, right? He had, uh, as it says here, seven sons, three daughters. So, uh, ten children in all. And they would have these banquets, and apparently they were so big, they would just take turns having banquets. And just in case, just in case, they, they may have sinned, whether they did or not. But just in case, Job feared the Lord, and he would purify his children after these banquets and, uh, and, uh, and offer burnt offerings, it says, for all of them. Because he would think, just in case, they sinned and cursed God. And so he would do this. This is an example of how he feared the Lord. He feared God because he knew that if they did this, they're in danger. They're, they're absolutely in danger. Uh, and he would do this just in case they sinned. So let's move on. St still in Job chapter 1. So Job 1, 8 through 11. Job 1, 8 through 11, and it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands. And, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. So, so excuse me, we have Satan who is uh, speaking to the Lord. Interesting enough, the Lord brings it up and says, Hey, have you considered? Have you thought about Job? And Satan is basically saying, Yes, I have. And God says he's a man of, of, of integrity. He fears God. Right? So this is a good thing. He fears God. But Satan answers, does he fear you for nothing? Does he fear God for nothing? Don't you do all these things for him? You're not letting me touch him. I can't do anything to him. You keep a hedge around everything he has. You bless everything that he does. So he, fear, so he fears you because you do all these great things for him. However, you do these things to him. You strike him. You strike him with poverty. So I, I, I really emphasize that because Satan is not saying, let me do this to him. He is telling the Lord, you do this. And if you do this, then he'll curse you to your face. So it was important. That it, it, that it is known that it's coming not from Satan, but from the Lord. And we'll go into a little bit of detail what that is. So, he's telling them, you should do this. Stre uh, stretch out your hand. He didn't say, let me do this. It's stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns. And he will surely curse you to your face. So, he does. So, he says, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. Right? The Lord says, yes, do this. So, Job loses his property, and he loses his sons and daughters. They die in the process, right? And Job's response, I'm going to take us to Job chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Job chapter 1, verses 20 
through 21. And that says, Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of Yahweh, or the Lord. So, after all of this, losing his property, losing all of his children, he worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord because he feared him. He feared him. So, the Lord, and then he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And that is very true. He has given him all of these things and then he took them away. But he worshipped him. So, let's see what the response is. So, I'm going to go to Job chapter 2, verse 3. Job chapter 2, verse 3. And it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity. Even though you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause. So, the Lord commends him. Says, he fears God. He says, he fears God and maintains. He, re he retains his integrity. Right? And, take note of what he said. Even though you incited me against him, the Lord did these things to Job. And it's important that, it, that we understand that. The Lord gave him all these things, and then he took them away, right? So he took them away. So the Lord says it. It says, you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause. He says, so now look at him. He still retains his integrity. He still fears God. So let's look at the response from Satan. So I'm going to go to Job chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Job chapter 2 verses 4 through 5 and it says skin for skin Satan answered the Lord a man will give up everything he owns in exchange for his life but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse curse you to your face so Satan is saying for his own life he will curse you if you do this again He's saying it's not coming from Satan, it's coming from God. He's saying you do this, you do this. Because it's easy to think, well, if Satan does it, then I'll just curse Satan. He says, no, 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 you do this. If you do this to him, he'll no longer fear you. He will curse you. He will curse you to your face. So, Satan has said this, this is what you should do. And then we're going to move on to Job chapter 2. Verses 7 through 8. Job chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. And it says, So Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat amongst the ashes. Sat among the ashes. So now we have a man who enjoyed the best of life. And in a very short time frame, he is now without property, without family, and without his health. In a very short amount of time. Lost everything. Right? So this is so remember we're talking about fearing the Lord. Initially he had everything. Satan said it is for that reason that he fears you, because he has everything. You take it from him, he has no reason to fear you anymore. So everything was taken from him. So, let's move on. Job chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Job chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. And it says, His wife said to him, Do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said so his wife is saying why are you still 
worshiping a God who does nothing for you. Go ahead and curse him so that you'll die and let this be done with. Why are you still suffering in all of this? Curse God and die. So get it over with. Cause get it over with is basically what she's saying. You're still living in this condition and you're worshiping God? No. Go ahead and curse him and get it done with. He's not doing anything for you. And so Job responded, this, this way of thinking is foolish. You're speaking as a foolish woman, right? Is what he's saying. He says, both good, both good days and bad days, they come from the Lord. And I'll accept either. So he understands that good and bad come both from the Lord. They're both coming from his hands and he'll accept either. Right. And so it specifically says after that, that when he said this, that good and the bad comes from from him, that he did not sin by what he said. So he was right. Let's go to a certain scripture. Ecclesiastes 714. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 714. And that says. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man cannot discover anything that will come after him. So Ecclesiastes is teaching us that both of them come from the hand of the Lord. They both the good days and the bad days come from him. So, uh, and specifically so that we just can't, apparently so we can't predict what's going to happen to us. We have good days and we have bad days. So please consider this. You may be in the bad days, but good days ordained from the Lord are coming. On vice versa. You may be in the good days, but be certain that bad days ordained by the Lord are coming. What I've learned in my, my futile life is that the decisions you make in either one will determine how long they stick around. So for example, if you make, if you're in the bad days and you make good decisions, you follow the Lord. You are listening to his commands, right? You're in the bad days. I found that they've shortened. They're still going to come. But they're short, they shorten. If you are in the bad days and you make bad decisions, you curse God, you do things wrong, you're still bad to your neighbor, you're still not thinking of others, you're still thinking of yourself better than others, then you still have good days coming, but your bad days may be extended. On the flip side, if you're in the good days, if you're in the good days, Understand that bad days are still coming. But if you make the right decisions in the good days, then you may extend them. If you make bad decisions in the good days, you may very well shorten them. So at the end of the day, at, at the end of all of this, understand that whatever position you may be in, you are granted both good and bad days. So if you're in the bad days, be at peace knowing that you have good days that are coming. But if you're in the good days, do not think that adversity is not around the corner because it surely is. Okay? So going back to where I need to be at. So he says this about uh, that, uh, that both come from the hand of the Lord. And from the Lord himself, he tells us, and again, we're talking about fearing God, and I'm going to wrap it up. So Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, and that says, and I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more, but I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. 
So we're told to fear God. Be afraid. Be afraid. Because not only can he kill the body, but also he can destroy our soul. Right? That doesn't sound like just regular old respect. Fear. That's, that's, that's a healthy fear. Right? So do we, my question is, to myself also, do we truly fear God? Do we truly believe what his son has told us about him? Do we truly fear him? Do we truly believe that he does those things? Do we think that somehow he never do those things to me? Right? Remember, good days and bad days are coming. Right? So do we truly fear God? Is this fear sufficient enough to keep us from sinning? Is this fear, is it sufficient enough to cause us to not be afraid of family? More afraid of family than we are of the Lord, right? We don't want the family to distance themselves from, from us because we're so serious about these things of God. What about politics? I bring this up often. What about politics? Are we more afraid? Are we afraid if we hold accountable those we vote for that their followers will turn on us are we afraid of the people and so because of that we're silent even though we know some wrong is being done what about our friends are we afraid that they will not accept us if we share the gospel what if are we afraid that that they're going to uh, talk bad about us or even bring up things that we do if we tell them about a particular sin that they're doing that the Lord will reveal his wrath on are we more afraid of what they may say and what they may reveal about us as opposed to being afraid of God himself or what about pride are we uh, is our fear of God sufficient enough to drive down our pride, right? And therefore uphold others is more important than ourselves? Is our fear of God, does it sufficiently suppress our pride so that we can uphold others as more esteemed than ourselves as we are commanded to do? What about humility? Does our fear of God bring about a meekness? These are just questions that we need to ask ourselves. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't do any of those things, then we do not sufficiently fear the Lord. And I know it's a struggle. This is the reason why we tend to go over a very harsh scripture. We should not be surprised when he comes and he returns. We need to be reminded often that he is not who we are. He doesn't think like we think. That we are an evil people. It is in our flesh to do this. And it's good to be reminded. It's good to be reminded of these things. So that we will fear God. And know that if he comes and stands next to us, should we be joyful? Or should we be afraid? We should be afraid and there's this this is a good thing to be constantly reminded that who he is and who we are that there is a massive expanse of space in between those two things because if not we will tend to think God's about right here and I'm somewhere around here and that's just not true. That's not true. It's, it's better for us to think of others as better than ourselves. We are told that it is better for us to do this because Jesus even brings up a parable, talks, talks about uh, being invited to uh, a banquet. Don't just go and take the best seat because you may very well be embarrassed when you're told to go down to another area and then someone else is brought up to sit in that seat so 
as best as you can, I know that this is hard, but as best as you can, take be think of yourself as lower than others. Let God exalt you, not your own mind. I love y'all. Enjoy your 4th of July. I hope you enjoyed your 4th of July. Enjoy your freedom that you're given in Christ. But never forget that you are to think of others above yourself. Thank y'all for supporting this page. Thank y'all for uh, supporting the local church, Eternal Truth. Uh, if you're able to give, we're very thankful for it. Either way, we're thankful for y'all. Love y'all. Be safe. Bye.